Welcome to a festive edition of Forbidden Planet TV uh, with my regular guest, my favourite guest. It's the one and only Michael Moorcock. How are you, mate? I'm fine, thanks. Hello, everybody. So uh, Merry pre-Christmas to you, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, and uh, we've just been doing a few uh, festive bits and pieces off camera. A bit, a bit more on that later. We've got some great things to talk about with some of your upcoming projects with my uh, colleagues at Titan. And, um, and we've also got up Forbidden Planet, we've got some beautiful signed editions that will be in stock in the new year for your all new El Elric book, The uh, Citadel of Forgotten Myths. Not only has Mike signed those, but in some of them as a kind of Easter egg, there are some, there are some little messages in there as well, right mate? Yes, yeah, not all of them, just, just, uh, just if you're lucky or unlucky, depending how you uh, look at it really. Yeah. So I think the best way anybody's intrigued by that is like be vigilant and uh, you can you can pre-order one of those signed editions from the links here. All they'll be throughout the Forbidden Planet stores in the new year. But one of the things we've talked about a couple of times on our podcast, Michael Moorcock's Multiverse, and we've talked about here at Forbidden Planet TV, um, is your relationship with the BBC and the uh, playing or not playing the records produced during your, your music career with the Deep Fix. And uh, you very tantalisingly told me a while ago that you might have made a discovery about that. Well, um, it's only, you know, you don't think about it most of the time. I mean, I don't, I did, don't sit around brooding, you know, why, why was I didn't, you know, never on, on the radio here? Or the, I mean, I've been on the radio a lot um, over the years, obviously. But, but um, there was one thing, um, I, I used to know them, the, the producer of Desert Island Discs. He was a very nice BBC producer. I mean, he didn't just do Desert Island Discs, but he was a radio producer. He was constantly trying to get me on um, Desert Island Discs. And Roy Plumley steadfastly refused, point blank, to have me on. And, I, you know, it's something that I, I, I've often wondered, why me? You know, what I ever say or do to Roy Plumley? Um, I've, you know, I've always liked Desert Island Discs um, and so on. Um, and uh, I began to realise after a while that, that the BBC was nervous of two things. One was the title of my band, which had never occurred to me um, as such that it was a, an illicit drug um, reference. I mean, I know it sounds stupid, but I thought of the deep fix as being a a deep fix on something, I, I mean, like, you know, concentrating on something, that sort of thing. Um, and it was the title of a story, which was sort of about that. There were drugs involved, but it wasn't like I was you know, promoting drugs. I mean, I, I didn't feel any need to promote drugs. Um, I, I didn't want other people to have the drugs. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I, I, so, so, and after a while, I began to realise that there was this whole thing had built up with the New World's... Um, with the with the with the new world's problem that we'd had in the 60s um from about 1967 i think it was um and until pretty much until until i sort of left england um every so often you know i'd, I'd get an invitation from the bbc you know and i'd do it but and then so, and somebody would say you know well would you would you like to do this or would you like to do that and i'd say sure yeah and nothing would come of it and and it be i I, without, I didn't think about it. I mean, I really didn't brood on it. But just lately, for some reason, thinking about the BBC, maybe because I'm watching incredibly old antiques roadshows on a on a very obscure American cable channel. Um, but 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 I, I suddenly began to realise that that all these things had sort of added up to make me a a dodgy, a slightly dodgy, um, you know. Uh, client as it were that they weren't too sure what i was going to say or do um although i did a, a, on one on one tv show i did advocate blowing everything up so maybe there was, was a reason for it but, but it's a very strange thing um you know when all of my friends were sort of you know all around me were sort of um doing stuff for the bbc I, i've never had a play or a short i think I, yeah i had a short oh i had a short story read on um on radio but it was the day that the i think it was the falklands war no 
yeah, it was the Falklands, I think. No, it wasn't. But it's something like that. It was a it was a big event, and so the thing got pushed back to some incredibly just the small hours of the morning, and that was about the only thing I've ever had original come out on 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 radio. It's uh, it's a strange thing. Anyway, that so, that was it. No, so no you, big deal. So, so basically, it was it's one of those revelatory moments where you look back and go, oh wait a minute. Yeah, it, that's yeah, what it was. It, it was staring me in the face all the time. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I knew Roy Plumley hated me, but I didn't know why. I mean, I had no idea why. Um, I was never told, you know. <laughs> they just said, well, I'm sorry, Roy hates you. <laughs> so, and I've always resented that because Jimmy Ballard got on Desert Island Discs, and I know for a fact he was tone deaf, absolutely tone deaf. He couldn't right. tell one yeah. record from another. Yeah. He really couldn't. And, and and I'm thinking, Jimmy's on Desert Island Discs, the thing he... You know that that's not fair. I, I, I'm not tone deaf. I've got lots lots of music I like. <laughs> I can... It's it's funny you should say that because I distinctly remember when I was on the NME. I remember um, Stephen Dalton coming in one day. Who was one of the was the one of the editors at the NME at the time. He's gone on to be you know he's he's a journalist. Does a lot of work for a lot of the. Uh, you know, broadsheet newspapers and whatnot, you know, he's, he still yeah. works to this day. But Dalton had been out to interview Ballard and he came back and he was he was saying, Ballard doesn't, never listens to music, ever. He, he's like, he's just not interested in music. That's we're right. He's pulling our leg and he's like, straight up. He There's no music in his house. He, yeah. he, he never listens to it. It's just does not, right. doesn't mean anything to him. And, so and honestly, his, his, his demeanour with my friends in the music business was, was very strange and very strained. I mean, it was a oh, uh, uh, well, jolly good. What uh, 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 what do you play? Um, the bazooka hunker. Oh yeah, so jolly good. Um, yeah, um, and and it would all and he'd just be constantly um, if if by some you know frequently happen by some alchemy two lots of different people were visiting me at the same time. Particularly Jimmy, um, he 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 would actually sit be sitting on the edge of his seat the entire time. Say 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 Nick Turner or Lemmy was 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 visiting, and he'd just be doing his best to be polite, but incredibly awkward and and feeling feeling. Um, same thing happened with Brian Aldis. I mean, Brian once asked me to take him to uh, to introduce him to some people to write some. Uh, music for his rock lyrics and so I, I did I took him around to see some some friends of mine in in the pink fairies who I thought would be probably get on with well and all of whom read science fiction so they knew his name I mean you know they were all kind of um very you know they followed his work um and the same thing happened I mean Brian just just sort of seized steezed up um, and could barely speak. Well, you know, everybody else was being perfectly friendly and nice, um, admittedly a little bit stoned, um, you know, and, uh, well, you know, it's just sort of a typical, as it were, Labrick Grove rock and roll house. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and nothing ever came of it. He, he, he'd sort of, he, he, his idea was, I think, um, not the Pink Fairies, but... Uh, <laughs> um, that band who did a whiter shade of pale. I mean, really. Oh yeah, wet, Procol Harum. Um, Procol Harum, yeah. Who were you know? Who, who your mum's rock and roll band, as it <laughs> yeah, were. That's I mean, right. That is so true. That is so true. <laughs> frilly shirts and the whole thing. Um, anyway, but and he said to me, "No, I meant somebody like Procol Harum." I said, so "I don't know anybody like that." I'm sorry. Anyway, no, it's a very odd thing that we've talked about it a bit before, and and uh, and um, it's. Uh, it, it, I, I suppose I was just a little bit younger than most of my contemporaries, and, and that would have probably made the difference. I don't know. Also, of course, I, I was and, familiar with. And I think you've always rocked that sort of uh, polite yet anti-establishment vibe somehow. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I think yeah. that's them responding to 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 to, to that. And I'd, I I don't know. It would seem to me that maybe they're somewhat intimidated by the focus of your work and the focus of your thinking. You know what I mean? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I think, you know, the other thing is drugs and booze and most most of the 
older science fiction people were boozers rather than druggies. Yeah. I mean, very few of them did did drugs at all. And if they did, it was sort of, you know, had LSD once sort of thing, you know, yeah. didn't like it, um, which is fair enough. I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> nobody has to, has to do drugs, but they were, it was, it was a, it was that straight. I mean, people like Kingsley Amis were were actively unpleasant about people, you know, who 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 were part of that culture. Um, and I don't, Jimmy didn't go that far, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did go that far in the company of the likes of Kingsley Amis. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, was, I mean uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, the thing about Kingsley Amis, I guess, I would imagine, you know, in given the given his output. Part of him was, you know, embracing some kind of classicist 1950s Bond fantasy inside his head. You know, oh, everything me? like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was very much. I always I always called him the uh, the pint the pint and flannel trousers brigade. I mean, I I just always saw them in pubs wearing, you know, slightly 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 smelly smelly flannel trousers and you know. And, <laughs> And I don't know, and, and and having a pint of beer, you know, <laughs> beer chaps, um, which I don't think I ever was uh, afraid to say. I, I did drink my fill, <laughs> I admitted when I was uh, oh, when I was right. younger in quite, Fleet Street. Quite right too. I mean, Fleet Street, yes. uh, Fleet Street, the very epicenter. I think we've talked about this before as well, but I remember turning up, you know, uh, as as a, like a a young magazine person, you know, in the in the in 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 the early 80s and being inducted into uh into uh going to scotland which was uh which was uh that was a a euphemism for going to the lock-ins at the scottish themed pub around the corner mid-afternoon oh, when they were supposed yeah. to be closed so you'd go for a meeting allegedly go for a meeting uh, with these yeah. old you know, you know, bruised up old uh, old sales guys in the magazine industry. I need just go and drink four or five pints. This would be every day, you know, mid afternoon. Oh well, as I think I may have mentioned, when I realised I was drinking between twelve and thirteen pints at lunchtime, I I I remember. I mean, it was in the King Lud, um, and it was at lunchtime, and uh, it was King Lud was closing, of course, because we didn't stop drinking till closing time. <laughs> Um, and uh, and me thinking, Christ, I've had 13 pints and I'm not drunk uh, and really began to think, you know, I, I, I did actually start to cut back at that point. Yeah. I thought that was you know, seemed crazy. I mean, spending, well, spending that amount of money and time just 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 chucking a beer down your throat. No, I did enjoy the I did enjoy the times. I mean, I can't can't say I didn't. Yeah, I, I um, mean, I, I I feel exactly the same way, you know. It, it, but uh, it's always nice to be able to talk about these things from the vantage point of no longer wrecking your body in quite the same. Yes, way. Right. yeah, and being still alive, you mean? Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> right, exactly. But actually, it's a good just, vantage point to have. It's the only vantage point, right, mate? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> On this note of good fellowship, I think that segues ni nicely, given the the festive tone of uh of of, the, of this episode uh to talk a bit about the festive season and 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 what your relationship has been with it over the years both personally and in your writing mike well uh i i think i i've always i've always um i've always liked festivals um so i don't really mind which which or whose festival it is really i mean if it's yeah. a festival let's go for it I've uh, I've been to some very nice Egyptian weddings, for instance, uh, and actually a Hindu wedding that was wonderful. I mean, I've Hindu been to weddings really marvelous. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, so you know, so festivals are you know I'm all for them. They're they're, they're great, and um, I don't think I wrote about them much. I'm trying to think until um, the mid '70s when I when I when I when I did um, the condition of music, the last of the Cornelius Quartet, um, which is a long Christmas scene, and I, but I, I'd been doing one or two. Yeah, I'd, I'd done a few um, parties, big parties, and things like that. I think again in Cornelius, because there was room to do that kind of um, scene in in a Cornelius book. You couldn't really put it in a Hawkwind Hawk Moon yeah, book. Yeah, you know? that's <laughs> so so true. Slash <laughs> Merry Christmas. Though <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's an idea. 
um, <laughs> I'm beginning to get, I'm beginning to think about it now. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, so uh, and I really the the next the next book the book I'm currently doing, which is the last of the uh, I, I call them Alsatian uh, the Alsatian trilogy or the Whitefriars trilogy. Um, uh, there's not really I mean there's much that as anything anyway. Um, and I've done four big big. Fest festival scenes for that, which I've really enjoyed doing. I mean, I'm still doing them actually. I've sketched them out, and and uh, um, and I'm, I'm I've I just decided to put as much jollity into this book as I could. Um, it's uh, I, I I got a little bit wound up with it because it being autobiographical, I'm I'm constantly on the alert. Um, not to hurt somebody's feelings or not to put in yeah. a, something that might not be, you know, there's a legend rather than the truth. Or if it's a legend, I want to say it's a legend, you know, rather than rather than just repeat it. I mean, it, it happens to me all the time. You know, I, every piece that comes out on me, um, all well meant, but they're, they're always, you know, they've always got something wrong or you know, often quite a few things wrong, minor things. And it's not, not that, you know, it's not that. But... Um, so I'm so with with autobiography. I'm I'm just anxious not to. I don't really want people to look at it and think that's not how it happened or that's not what happened or whatever. So I'm so I've had to find a way of framing it because there's also a lot of fantasy in it as well, um, so that it kind of it works um, to show that it's not it's not a that there's no malice in it. I think that's probably what I'm trying to say. It's more a celebration than. Than, than anything else. And a bit of self-revelation because I'm very puritanical and I have to wrap myself over the knuckles from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what's it? What's the title of this next book? Oh, um, The Wounds of Albion, yeah. which is totally confusing because the one that's coming out in this coming year, 2023, is, um, is called The Woods of Arcady. So, yeah. Retailers are really going to hate me for that, and I can see it now. This is the book you ordered. No, I didn't. I ordered the Woods of Albion. Well, this is the. Oh no, it's the Wounds of. Uh, um, and, but I, I, I had to have that title. I mean, I, it's the thing was sort of. It's pretty much set in in stone. The titles. Um, so um, there they are. Um, but I, I, I don't know what people will make of it. I, I've. Um, I've been reading a few reviews of, of Elric that, that people have um, people who are not that familiar with Elric have been reviewing it, and I'm thinking, wow, if this is strange to them, then then the uh, the wounds of uh, the, the woods of Arcady are going to is going to be even stranger, because um, that's got that's got every that really has virtually everything but the kitchen sink in it. I, I tell you the other thing, you know, that, I mean, since since uh, we, we're talking about. We have been talking about Titan. I was I was pleased to to see that the uh, the multiverse comic is coming out next year, yeah. which um, which which has been announced on Amazon. It's the first time I saw it was on was on Amazon. Um, but I, I thought I thought you know, Titan weren't going. Well, I, I assumed that Titan wouldn't want to have done that one for various reasons, and that there's you know there's a lot of different stories and that sort of thing. But I'm very pleased they are doing it. Oh yeah, we're, we're extremely excited about it, actually, mate. I mean, you know, we were talking, uh, we were talking uh, before the before we started filming that uh, we each had our different ways into finding this piece of information out. But uh, <laughs> one thing I do, I've had quite a lot of conversations about it internally now, and uh, I always I was held out a secret hope that we would do it, and the fact that we are, I know that that's a decision that came right from the top down. It's something that Nick Lando, our, our owner and joint CEO, co-owner with his wife Vivian. Um, they 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 really wanted to do it, and I'm glad that we're doing it. And, and mm, me too. Yeah, and we're going to do it in a couple of volumes, and volume one is going to come out in July next year. Uh, and and actually, like uh, like the uh, signed edition of um, the signed edition of the new Elric, um, it's uh, that is already available for pre order, and will be attached to the links attached to this conversation. Actually, mate. And what can you remember about about that series coming about? Well, the multiverse. Um, well, um, the uh, I think I think Paul at um, DC originally asked me to 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 do to do uh, 
if I wanted to do a story for them. And at that time, they were being very experimental with the Vertigo comics and stuff like that. I mean, they were doing all kinds of different different things, DC. Um, and so I, I, I thought, well, you know, um, why not do a, a comic about the multiverse? It seemed to me an ideal form for the, for, for the multiverse. Um, I, I tend to draw draw a lot of my scenes. I mean, I don't draw very well, but I I I, I draw out a lot of scenes, and and uh, and I thought that you know the multiverse scene on the on the page, as it were, would uh, would work. Um, but I also did it. I mean, it didn't go down particularly well in the states um, because I, partly because I misjudged the readership. I'd, I'd gone to the San Diego Comic Convention um, the year before. Um, another publisher had taken me there to it was White Wolf doing those editions, yeah. just the books, had nothing to do with comics. But while I was there, I was very impressed by how smart the comics readers were, or how many of them, uh, many of them yeah. were very smart and young. Um, and uh, and I thought. You know, this this is this is this is you know this is a market I can address as it were. This is a readership I can actually talk to. Um, I think I misjudged the numbers because they still basically preferred Superman, you know, as it were, to um, to anything else. But that's that's the way of comics. I've learned that since, you know. Yeah. But but uh, but nonetheless, I, I and I thought I thought I'd do it more like a weekly. English comic where you had serials running every every week, so I had three different serials running through it, all of them designed to meet up at the end and make a, a sort of grand finale, um, with all of the characters kind of blending into into you know set characters, um, and and uh, God I can't remember the editor's name. I mean he's a very really nice bloke and. I came to know him pretty well. It here. was it was Stuart Moore, right? Was the editor? Stuart, Stuart Moore, Moore, that's right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, really good editor. I mean, I really really liked liked him. And 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 uh, anyway, um, so yeah, so so he 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 proposed the artists actually, except for one, Mark Reeve, who was my my proposal, who I still like, but I don't think most people did like. But I still like him. I mean, he was very good for what I wanted, um, and. Uh, and so I, you know, I decided to run those stories uh, month by month, three stories, all ultimately coming together at the end in the in at the end of the year, the twelfth twelfth issue. Um, but it really, the format really puzzled a lot of American readers. They just couldn't 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 get what was going on. And to me, of course, it was very familiar. It was just like doing you know a couple of things for Lion or Tiger every yeah, every of week. Course. <laughs> um, and and I was used to running those sorts of serials. You know, I, I, a friend of mine um, who was also a writer for Fleetway, Frank Redpath, he went completely nuts for a while. He actually became a shrink in the end, which is often what happens. Um, anyway, he, he, and and I remember him. He was doing a lot of work for schoolgirls picture library and the, the school friend. I think it was the the, the girls the girls papers. Um, the last person you would think, you know, <laughs> writing stories for little girls, but there it was. And when he went mad, he he, he phoned all the editors at Fleetway, um, trying to tell them all how the stories were all going to finish. And he had all these different, you know, serials running, and had just kind of given up and 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 gone been mouth frothing off the road. He went went to Hull, I think, in the end. He was from Hull, I think. And uh, anyway, and and so. So it, it was a bit confusing at that point, I think, for, uh, for 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 American readers anyway. They they couldn't quite get what what was happening. Yeah, I I think that's true. I mean, most of the experiments over the years to deliver comics in that very British weekly anthology format or anthology th format that's born out of that weekly environment. I think traditionally American comic book fans have always struggled with it because it's just not yeah. in their DNA. And DC yeah. have tried on at least two occasions to deliver comics in that way. 
remember there was Action Comics Weekly back in the mm -hmm. late, the nineties, yeah. yeah. And then they did these beautiful large format comics um, about ten years ago, which also we collected very very nice broadsheet style. But uh, and they were full of great artistic work. But um, but again, never really kind of caught on. And I think yeah. it, I, something I never realised until relatively recently in life. And this amazed me, and this just made me think of it, is there are people who struggle to read comics and struggle to actually navigate their way through a comic book. Page. Absolutely. I've, I've talked about this myself. Um, I, um, Linda can't read comics. <clears throat> she just doesn't know how to start, where to start. My, my brother-in-law uh, can't either, which is how I found out about yes, this. Yeah, I'm, I was I'm, amazed. I, I was talking to Anna Sinclair, and Sinclair's wife, and she's a... She's a um, school teacher and she said oh yes i can see because she, she has the same problem she can't get comics and she said oh i see yes just as you have to teach children to read in a certain order how to how to you know how to approach reading um because obviously if you just look at it it's just a jumble of black and white letters on on a, on a sheet yeah. of paper um so you have to teach a child the order to read in um you know both words and sentences and all that. Um, so it's obviously, it's, a, it's, it's something that people like us have obviously taken to automatically, never had any trouble with, but others just look at it and to them, it's like cacophony on the page. They just don't yeah. know where to go with it. And, and indeed some of the modern, modern, uh, modern comics I like that anyway. So, <laughs> and, and you know, the, yeah, that's absolutely right. There are some modern comics that, even for seasoned comic book veterans like ourselves, <laughs> they can be a bit challenging sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. My, my, uh, my, my, my brother in law was telling me this after he retired. It wasn't the point of his conversation. He happened to mention it in passing where I was like, oh, you know, I know you don't really normally read comics, but the something I'd really enjoyed, I think, it was a Brie Baker and Phillips book. And I was like, this is a crime book. It's really, it's great. You should read it. And he was like, I can't read comics. I honestly thought he was pulling my leg at first. And then when he got into it, he, that's exactly it. He looks yeah. at it and it's just a jumble. That instinctive yeah. through line that you have. I, I, yeah. Isn't it fascinating that-, that It that, is, I mean, because, you know, because the other thing is, you know, that, that comics have their own very specific, I mean, you don't write comics the way you write a novel, uh, it's closer to writing a film script, but but you have, I mean, in a classic, classically written comic, you have the the um, the uh, continuity box, as it were, you know, <laughs> and then, <laughs> whatever you yeah. um, And uh, I mean, hopefully something a bit a bit more useful than that. Um, <laughs> Then you have the picture, true believers or whatever. <laughs> yes, that's right. And then, um, then you have the picture of the action that's being taken, which isn't described. I mean, or shouldn't be described. It should be you know, done by the artist. Um, then you have the the, uh, the the speech balloon. So you've got three you've got three narratives you can tell at the same time in a comic. Yeah. Um, I don't say that many comics people in the past used them as you know like as well as they have been used in recent times. I think they have anyway, yeah. but it, but it's, uh, it's definitely a technique that, that, that um, I suppose I had instinctively when I went to Fleetway, I mean, it didn't, I didn't have any problems at all. You know, I just jumped right in and started doing it. I didn't realize that it was a, it was an unusual skill that you, there weren't that many people who could write comics, um, you know, who could actually do the job. In an ordinary way, I mean, just telling a Kit Carson story or a, you know, or a Dick Turpin story, or something like that, um, and and so you know, you you realise, or at least I realise, I had valuable skills I didn't I didn't actually know I had, um, and and I remember, I mean, I used to try to get you know get new writers in on on various various comics we were doing, and some of them simply could not. They wanted it because the money was really good. I mean, Fleetway money was much better than American money um, at, at the time I was there anyway. I mean, it's, it, it was, you know, it was very well paid. Um, so a lot of people wanted, wanted to, to write Battle of Britain or, you know, or, um, or Rock Fist Rogan or whatever it was. Um, but not many of them could. I mean, they, they, they just, you know, they just, it just didn't come off, come off the page somehow. I, I, I think that's a, that's a very, very interesting point. And, and, uh, 
why I think, you know, I, I think comic scripting is, is frequently, comics writing is just uh, frequently under-regarded by many authors, you know, in term, but in fact, it's a really specific skill, as you say. Oh, you yeah. Know. And also, I mean, in terms of learning, what I learned, how I learned to write, I learned so much through comics. Yeah. Um, learning, you know, that every every scene counts and you have to have a scene to count <laughs> to make it work, as it were, and, and to think in terms of scenes. Um, I'm sure you could probably get a similar, develop similar skills writing movies, I'm, I'm, but, yeah. uh, but the problem with movies is there's so much money involved, there's so many more people involved yeah. telling you what to do that it's hardly worth, worth it because half of them don't know what they're talking about anyway, as you, you, know, as you begin to discover. Um, in fact, more than half, I would think, <laughs> if my experience is anything. Ninety percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, and I think actually that's why how you get bad movies. They start from the very beginning as bad movies because people don't actually know what they're doing or don't know enough what they're doing. And then you see, you know, there are formula movies that come out you know, they're knocked out one after another, all to the same formula. All the Marvel movies, for instance, pretty yeah. much are pretty much exactly the same producer led movies with a very with a, with a very familiar sensibility yeah, and format right. you know yeah, yeah. And, and entirely you know derived to make money i mean that's that's yeah. their job I, I i don't i don't knock them for that but i, I was surprised i was looking at uh, the number of movies that are that, you know best best grossing movies of uh, of this century i think and it's astonishing there isn't one that I could see that was not um, a superhero movie of some sort or yeah, you know, I, I mean this is a I think this is a very rich subject actually, Mike, because of course I, I had some I have very mixed feelings about because the the comic book fanboy part of me, you know, the journalist who became a journalist because I learnt my English skills reading comic books at the age of three, and the whole thing it gives you what you it, what I, I think it's really key about you know, journalism about is about brevity and reduction, right? And if you read comic books, which are in, in, a, in an enforced space that is very small, it's all about brevity and, and kind of, you know, and, and not overwriting. And I think yeah. and the way to tell stuff leanly, which is what journalism is at its best. Absolutely, be. yeah. All those yeah. skills are there on the page, right? So very much like yourself, I was very influenced by it all. And I've always been a comic book lover and, and, and I, I love, you know, complex adult comic books, and I, I love superheroes. I love all of it. And on the on the one hand, the ten year old Sumner is there. You know, watching these Marvel movies, going, "Man, there's there's a whole like Holly movie devoted to Captain America." You know, unbelievable. But you know, I mean, he, he, the the fact is, cinema release has just become an endless roller coaster of spectacle, yeah. right? And and the the room for you, you know, your taxi drivers and what have you. Those films, you know, okay, it's we are in a golden age of television, but television has become the migration point for all this kind of great drama that was once actually on the movie screen. Yes, and also television is beginning to show signs of uh, needing needing a shot in the arm. Actually, I think I, I, um, I absolutely they, agree with that. They're extending series far too far too long, making 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 perfectly good subjects simply boring. Um, I can't. I mean, I can't count the number of, of TV series I've started to watch and then I've just got fed up with because they're taking too long to develop because, you know, it's the old, you know, it's the old, old story. I, I, we, we had a joke about this on Facebook. I, I, I don't know if you were involved in the joke or not, but anyway, it's on the same Facebook we both go to, um, which said if, uh, if um, was it Six Days of the Condor? Yeah. Is that the original? That yeah. if it that it, that if it was made um, if it was made as a movie, it would become as it did Three Days of the Condor. <laughs> right. But if it was made as a TV program, it would become probably Forty Eight Days of the Condor Absolutely or right. more. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, uh, you, know, you and I were talking about um, about uh, say the latest um, iteration of uh, Lord of the Rings, that TV show stuff, and and I you know I, I actually I actually 
quite enjoyed the original Jackson trilogy, right? But I never finished watching The Hobbit because I thought the whole thing was so massively overworked yes, and overlong. Absolutely. It, it's yeah. a very lean, beautifully written children's novel. Yeah, you don't exactly. need three, four hour movies to tell that story. You know? Well, that's my argument with Kubrick, believe it or not. I, I'm, I'm talking about one of Kubrick's best loved films, which I hated. And it was Barry Lyndon, which is a very lean book. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. a short, fast book, and it and it's a great book, very funny, ironic. Um, you know, the tone. You know, some of the over the um, voiceover gets the tone of the book, but but he extended that you know, to, to have these fucking sunsets or God knows what. Yeah, you're know, waiting for for yeah. days to the sun to come up in the right place or you know. In, on the right face or whatever, then it just destroyed what was good about the book. And, and I could not, I never have been able to see the film for anything but a really bad version of the book. And I, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, I mean, I, I'm, there are enough people who, who admire Kubrick and, you know, who see virtue in it for me, you know, for me to know that, that I am in a minority. But I cannot read that book without it seeming overblown and, and too busy, you know, and uh, I mean, see the movie. I, I um, always massively struggle with the, with the, with the core casting in that flick as well. You know, I, I never, yes, really, saw, yes, I never yes. really saw Ryan O'Neill as that character. No, no, I agree. I mean, you know, um, he'd, he'd been lucky, I think Kubrick in some of his casting in the past, but I think he, I mean, I don't think, I felt this about Dr. Strangelove. I mean, I, I I don't really want to sit here and just complain about things, but to me, there was far too much Peter Sellers in Dr. Strangelove. He just, it was just overdone and it distracted from the, from the, as it were, point of the film. Um, too much business, you know, and uh, yeah. for me, um, obviously not for most people. So, no, I, so this is really, a, um, you know, a, my minority complaint, I suppose. But I do, I do agree about that because I think you have a profound sense in Doctor Strange Love, and you're right; it's not it's not the popular view. But I think you can feel when you watch it, Kubrick falling in love with Sellers' performance and his versatility. Absolutely, and hell, it's kind yeah. of like you can see him behind the camera, kind of going, "This yeah. guy can do anything. This yeah. is amazing." Well, yeah, you know, and and it's a brilliant showcase for all of that unique ability that Sellers had, or that mm -hmm. kind of soulless ability of his. But, um, but uh, yeah, it kind of, did, you know, it, the, all these kind of long years that just to distract from what's actually going on. Yes, yeah, and and I, I don't know, anyway, that, that was, I, I actually sat beside um, uh, the guy who'd written Red Alert, which was supposed to be what Dr. Strangelove was based on, a long way from it. Um, and some other guy as well who'd been involved in the writing. Anyway, and, uh, I, um, you know, because science fiction writers get invited to press shows with science fiction themes. I mean, so I tended to see quite a lot of those films with whoever had written it or made it or whatever. Um, and uh, and this poor bloke was just, was just, 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 fizzing with frustration and misery as he watched the film. Everybody else, of course, was loving it. Um, and, 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 and I can't remember his name. And, uh, and, and I only happened to be sitting next to him. I didn't know him at all, but, but he was just going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Which often happens, of course, with with movies, and I mean, it's happened to me. It's, I think it probably happens to everybody. But um, but it was very it was very funny. <laughs> Every time Sellers came back on, he would be another groan for poor bastard. <laughs> did, did you ever did you ever get a chance to meet Kubrick? Oh yes, um, yeah. Kubrick actually him? courted me. Um, I, I've thought that had to be the case, <laughs> and I have letters to prove it. Um, I wouldn't have anything to do with him. I, 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 I knew what a nightmare he was to work with because I had enough friends who'd worked with him. I mean, both Arthur Clarke and Brian Aldiss, you know, had, had books developed by him and uh, just gone mad in the process <laughs> and uh, you know, both winding up in tears at some point. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, and I, and, um, oh, and I think, um, Jimmy was the only. Oh no, that wasn't that wasn't Kubrick. That was what's his name. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I sort of I knew to stay away from him. But I was Spielberg, right? Is that what you're Spielberg? Yeah. yeah, I was. I was 
I was thinking it's funny he didn't seem to have any trouble with, with but that's because yeah. it wasn't uh, Different it wasn't, person, yeah. yeah it wasn't Kubrick um uh but um where 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 Kubrick was concerned I I I he'd He'd actually thrown me off the set of 2001. Didn't I ever tell you this story? No, I, I, I oh. so want to hear this. Well, Harry Harrison and I went down to, the, to um, Elstree, I think it was, where, where they were making it. Um, perfectly uh, on invitation from the, the publicity director, or whoever it was, not, not, not from Kubrick, but possibly from his assistant, whose name I think was Tony something. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, we were down there, and it was already run, it was already overrun by two years, and there were all these sets that were abandoned sets, and we were being shown them perfectly innocently by the person showing us around. Oh yeah, Stanley thought he'd try that out for the ending, but it didn't come off. Um, so that, you know, yeah, that was going to be an ending that Stanley, you know, but we decided, you know, it's, no, it can't be that. And I began to realize, as did Harry, that he didn't have an ending for the bloody thing. He just didn't have it. Um, whatever, you know, whatever he was saying, he had not yet found an ending that suited him, um, which is fair enough. I mean, we didn't we didn't think any, didn't think ill of him for that. But anyway, we were we were we were having a look at that big um, round thing that. You know, people went round and round in. I can't remember what it was yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a big round yeah. thing. Um, when uh, in a huge, um, you know, shed, um, one of those really big um, sheds, whatever they're called, you know, film, film movie sheds. sheds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, from a pretty far distance through a door at the other end come Kubrick and his assistant or an assistant, because I think we were with his assistant. Anyway, walks towards us, and we're ready to say sort of, hi, you know, how's it going? And without a word to either me or Harry, so he says he says to the person, with, get these people out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's some spam risk from your iPhone. What's happening? Hmm. Something strange happened. There was a glitch. Right? No, I'm fine. There was yeah. a glitch when you were, yeah. you were talking so, for a second. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, so he said, get these people out of here. And so we were got out of there. Um, not much longer after that, I started to hear from Kubrick. Uh, would I get in touch with him? He's, he had something interesting you know, he'd like to discuss. Jimmy Ballard had already heard from Kubrick. Brian had heard from Kubrick, and I think John Brunner had heard from Kubrick. We all knew that you know that he was stuck with 2001 and didn't want to ask Arthur because Arthur just wanted to put more technical stuff in. Um, and Arthur was very resistant to you know to losing all that technical stuff. Um, which I don't blame him, it's his film. Um but anyway, that's so we we would actually have a sort of a grapevine. You know, oh, Kubrick's phoned again, so we're trying to drag us into one of his one of his nightmare projects. Um, so by by um, I suppose by the mid eighties, whenever it was, when he was doing AI, anyway, um, I, um, I knew I, I oh no, well before that, of course, because yeah. Uh, but anyway, I knew enough not to get involved with Kubrick. That 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 uh, I think Ian Watson had had a had a go with Kubrick as well and, and driven him nuts as well. I mean, there wasn't anybody that Kubrick didn't drive nuts, including his own family by all accounts. So I, um, you know, I I just stayed clear. But I have these letters from Kubrick saying, you know, something of your to interest you know, like like to meet you and talk about something. <laughs> I never replied to them. And in fact, when I when I was leaving. Um, I don't know, leaving to go abroad somewhere. Um, Dave Tate was always looked after our house for us. And Dave was an incredible Kubrick fan. I mean, he wet his knickers at the very name Kubrick, you know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I said to him before I left, I said, oh, and by the way, if that Stanley Kubrick calls, tell him just to fucking stop, for God's sake, or he'll never work in this town again. And, and, and poor old Dave was just left kind of blub. Luckily, Kubrick didn't call. He didn't have to, didn't have to tell him. <laughs> Mate, that, that story is, I think, 
the perfect festive, unexpected festive gift and the perfect place <laughs> for us to close out this okay, episode. Yeah. That was absolutely brilliant, mate. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think getting kicked off the set of 2001 is, is uh, a badge of honour that you should wear with pride. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't feel particularly badly about it. I, I, I also thought I was going to like the film, but I didn't. I didn't, you know, in the end, like it. Um, and I liked it for the op opposite reasons that I disliked it, for the opposite reasons that Arthur disliked it. I mean, Arthur disliked it because there wasn't enough science in it. And I disliked it because there was too much in it. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a great science fiction, science, science fiction guy. I mean, I, I've hardly read a single astounding you know story or any of that yeah. kind of science fiction so um yeah anyway sorry you were trying to wind up and I, oh I yeah no, but it's, a, it's always good to have a bit of extra texture <laughs> so so mate this is this what with this being uh christmas time and all and i say that as an active and practicing non-christian you know i hope uh i hope that everybody watching this if they want to they can check out can pre-order uh, the latest Elric, beautiful signed edition from Mike. Um, have you, oh, look at that, eh? Look at that, yes. The Citadel of Forgotten Myths, and it's a beautiful edition as well, mate. It's really, yeah, really it's nice. a very, very nicely done, yeah. And yeah. everyone can order it for here from the links attached to the video. Uh, next year, we've got uh, the Multiverse series coming out, the Titan edition, which we've just been talking about a little bit. But I thought when we get into next year, mate, We'll get Walt Simonson along to have a chat with. Oh, that would be wonderful, yeah. We'll get Walt on the show. And also, I know that we're going to get a chance to get um, to get uh, Roy on as well um, next year. Oh, so, yeah, that'd be yeah. good. Yes. Um, I, I know we talked about the last time you were on. We couldn't make it work this year, but we're definitely going to... We'll definitely... He's up for it, so we'll definitely put it together in 23. Oh, great. Good. And, and yeah. all, all of that would be epic stuff. And, and of course... Uh, within the next day or so from this airing, our uh, our charity version of a hard degree Christmas Carol is going to be out and about with Mike playing a special guest starring role. And that will oh, be oh, that. Oh. <laughs> not that Check one, it out. Though. Not that one, but, but <laughs> no, close, but very very <laughs> close. Which Christmas Carol character is perfect for Michael Moorcock? I ask the people watching this. Well, you will find out in two days or so. And uh, and uh, we'll we'll put the links to that in in this episode, and you see it then. And Mike, I hope that you and Linda um, uh, have a lovely Christmas period, mate. Yeah, you too. You too. Good. Uh, have a good Yule. I think I think we can keep it as a pagan festival. I mean, I'm we all were over here first. That. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. No. Well, and it's these... always been a pagan festival. Uh, like those has, solstice exactly. bells ring. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I know. It's... That's it. Okay. That's a done deal. That's a yeah. done deal. Happy solstice. Happy and, solstice uh, indeed, yeah. brother. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, Mike, I, I will look forward to seeing you in early 23. Yep. You too, Andy. And, and you have a good one too. Yeah. Take um, care. And yeah. Th thanks again, as always, mate. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you. Mate. Oh, I always enjoy it. I always yeah. enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah. See you soon. Take Cheers. care. Yeah. Bye bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators. Subscribe right here. See you soon.